Yeah. But yeah, so it's all Joe's fault, basically. Okay. Isn't everything? That's true. If Joe were here, I'd say, I chortle at this. Chortle, I say. <laughs> yeah. All right. And oh, look, there we go. We're on the facey bookie. So, Yay. all right. Mr. Mr. Bailey, I turn this over to you and I'll be hiding in the back like any good phantom. <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome to another classic track quarantine panel. This week we are doing uh, To the Bat Panel, Season 3 of Batman 66. My name is Michael Bailey, and through trickery and deceit, I have been made the moderator of this panel. Um, and I, I'm going to blame Gary for this, but it's also my fault, because back in 2013 I said, hey, I'd like to start doing panels for you all, and this is where that leads. So this is both a panel and a cautionary tale. With me, <laughs> uh, I am a podcaster. I run the Fortress of Bailey 2 Podcasting Network, where I talk about Superman and Batman and all sorts of uh, <laughs> uh, all sorts of, uh, of comic book goodness. But I also recently had an essay printed in a wonderful tome about season three of the Batman 66 show with me. Yeah, it's <laughs> Keith is the one that was smart enough to put it in the shot. So <laughs> uh, to my right is Keith. Keith, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Keith. Uh, I'm Keith Ari DeCandido. I've written a whole lot of books. Um, I intend to write a whole lot more books, um, none of which is particularly relevant to this uh, panel. Uh, however, I did contribute to all three volumes of the Subterranean Blue Grotto essays on Batman 66, of which the latest is, is Book Box Splat here, um, which were put together by uh, Jazzy Jim Beard and assisted by Rollick and Rich Hanley. Um, yes, I'm mixing Marvel and DC metaphors here. Um, I uh, I also did a a, a, a rewatch of Batman sixty six for Tor dot com uh, in time for the show's fiftieth anniversary uh, in in and around twenty sixteen. Um, it was called Holy Rewatch Batman because what else were you going to call it? Um, and that was a fairly popular feature. I covered the entire show as well as the movie, and uh, I also reviewed the two uh, animated specials they did more recently um, for the Subterranean Blue Grotto series. I covered. Two Penguin episodes in the first two. I did um, uh, Fine Feathered Finks, uh, Penguins of Jinx, which was his first appearance. Uh, I did His Honor the Penguin, Dishonor the Penguin for season two. Uh, and, I'll, and, uh, and then for season three, I decided to not do the Penguin and instead wound up with the finale. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, so I did uh, uh, Minerva, Millionaires of Mayhem, uh, which... which didn't quite close out the volume because Jim had a little surprise for us at the end of volume three, but, uh, but I got to, to do the last episode. At least. So that's, that's, that's who I am. All righty. <clears throat> Excuse me. And below us, but only because that's where the panel placement is, is <laughs> Mr. John, go ahead and introduce yourself, John. Yes, I'm your old bat chum, John S. Drew here. I am a podcaster like Michael, and uh, I do podcast about the Batman television series 1966 on the Batcave podcast. Uh, we've actually completed our reviews of the television series proper and are kind of like at the moment looking at properties adjacent to Batman that have what I like to say, but everybody gets creeped out on it, Batman DNA all over it. Um, whether it's Electro Woman and Dyna Girl or the Filmation 77 Batman cartoon series or with um, your uh, Dragon Con uh, classics overlord, Joe Crow, we're looking at Monster Squad uh, as well. In fact, that's the current episode that's out at the moment here. And I too contributed to all three uh, volumes of Jim and Rich's uh, series there. I did uh, False Face for the first season. I did The Minstrel for the second season. And for the third season, which we'll be talking about here tonight, I did The Siren. Yeah, I, I, I have only contributed to one of the uh, volumes, uh, but I was really happy to do that. I, I, I really lucked out, too. I got a Penguin two-parter. Mm. Um the uh, what were those called again? I, I do not have the recall. Uh, the sport of penguins and a horse of another color with uh, oh, yes. the awesome, the awesomely named Lola Lasagna, yes. a, a woman with a questionable past. Uh, but we're here tonight to really focus in on season three, who is kind of usually the punching bag. Uh, I have seen online and mm -hmm. in in podcasting circles uh, for the series. Uh, everyone seems to love the first season. 
season, the second season seems to get the, most of them were good, but it started to go downhill. And then with season three, everyone's like, it was the worst season. But as I was watching the episodes that I was covering and kind of picking and choosing some other ones, I don't think it's as bad as people say. <laughs> I, I really don't. There was, it's interesting. Cause when I, when I, when I watched the show initially uh, when I was, when I was growing up, uh, I didn't know from seasons and, and, you know, I'm pretty sure they didn't air the episodes in much of an order either um, on, on channel 11 growing up in New York, but, or maybe they did. I don't know. I was like six. So but, um, a lot of my favorite memories are from the third season. In particular, I love Batgirl. I, I thought Batgirl was cool. I loved Eartha Kitt's Catwoman. Um, in fact, the thing that surprised me the most when I was rewatching the series uh, for Tor.com back in back six years ago was how few episodes Eartha Kitt was actually in. My memory of her was that she was in like half a dozen episodes and she was only in three. Um, she, she created quite the impression for that. And there are some other, and you know, you've got some of the, some of the most um, hilarious visuals uh, of the show come from the third season, including Batman surfing um, with the, with the trunks over it. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and some of the, you know, some of the guest stars, you had Milton Berle, you had Zsa Zsa Gabor, um, you had the return of, the, the bizarre return of Egghead, along with Olga, Queen of the Cossacks. There were some, there were some good villains in the third season, too. When it comes to the third season, uh, the way we approach it, because originally I was like, what are we going to do? What are we going to Because the third season, you know, like you said, Michael, you know, it's just, it's the worst. But as I was going through it, I came to appreciate a lot of what it, I mean, there are those things you're, you know, egghead. I, I feel Vincent Price got a bad deal with that one mm -hmm. because he, he just completely lost the edge of who he was as, as egghead and really became a comic foil than anything else. But overall, I often look at the third season as almost like, cause we do it all today, these days now on television when, when things aren't working off the soft reboot. Uh, in terms of tone, uh, in terms of awareness, because the first two seasons of Batman, I always felt that Batman, Adam West, Bruce Wayne was not aware of what was going on around him. He just reacted to things and to him it all seemed natural. When it came to the third season, at that point, Adam was kind of like, I want in on the joke. So he became a lot more self-aware and just sort of mugging for the camera. That Eartha Kid episode where they have the trial at the end and he gives that lengthy speech pontificating on the law and such. And he's just doing it with such relish. But it's very unlike his performances in the first season. Yeah, you know, Keith said two things that, that uh, sparked memories is that, like him, I, I watched it in reruns as a kid Sometimes on Channel 11, WPIX, oddly mm. enough, uh, because of where I lived in Pennsylvania, we got that channel for some bizarre really? reason. Yeah, yeah, we we got okay. New York City and Philadelphia channels. It was yeah. really weird. Uh, but I didn't, un you know, I was four or five years old. You don't understand what a TV season is. All <laughs> I was excited for is I would watch every episode and just wait for Robin to do his thing to see if Batgirl was going to show up. And when Batgirl showed up, I got really excited because I liked Batgirl as a kid. And the other thing that he said is that everybody who is coming to this series new in the present day mm -hmm. is having a completely different experience to the people that watched it in syndication, which is a completely different experience from watching it live on network television. And I'm wondering if that gives the third season more of a chance because people don't have the preconceived notions of watching it, growing up with it. They're just coming towards it. And I think for all of its faults, the third season made the best of limited resources. Like sometimes you could tell the set <laughs> was not extravagant. No. Like on, on the on the the, the I'm sorry, that was some kind of damning with faint praise award, right? Yeah. There. <laughs> it, 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 it it is. It's it, it's it's halfway there. But it's like when you, for example, the glue factory from the penguin episode. It was a sound stage with like five things on it and a horse, <laughs> and your mind kind of filled it in. But if you're going to look at Batman sixty six as an adaptation of a comic book, 
the first two seasons, especially the first season, is really representative of the of the of the stories that you saw in the late fifties and the early sixties. Oh, yeah. uh, they adapted most of them. Yeah. Uh, by the third season, they got an artist that didn't like to draw backgrounds, and that's kind of how I look at it. <laughs> the um, my my favorite thing, and I and I mentioned this in my essay and in in, in Oof Splat was in the Minerva episode at one point, uh, Minerva walks into a room, throws the door shut behind her, the door doesn't latch, and the whole wall moved. <laughs> yes. And they didn't do a retake. They had no more dams to give. <laughs> they didn't, I mean, it's like, it's, it's like watching an Ed Wood production. You know, it's just, uh, and that was, that was one of, one of the biggest problems with it to me was was that the the obvious budget problems i mean they were they were they obviously had no money to spend on anything mm -hmm. um and and i honestly i think a big problem was i missed the cliffhangers i missed the the i mean so, to be fair some of the cliffhangers were ridiculous it was like you know the, the entire there were several two-part episodes where the entire episode ground to a halt so we could do the cliffhanger and then mm -hmm. they get out of the cliffhanger and then they move on and go back to the story but even when they had two-part and three-part episodes, they didn't do cliffhangers, um, and that and that was a really odd decision. I mean, if, I understand you can't do it in a, in a single half-hour episode, but if if you're doing a two-parter or a th or even a three-parter like the the endless Londinium story, um, why not do cliffhangers? I just I that that really that was my biggest uh, one of my biggest issues with the season. Mm -hmm. It's funny because when we were getting to the end, in fact, it was the, the Minerva episode, uh, one of my guests, Robert Long, he pointed out, if you really look at those the third season episodes, the beats and many of them are still there. It's just yeah. like, because you say you missed the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger was often in the middle Sometimes, of the yeah. story. They, I mean, why they didn't put a cliffhanger for the two and three parters? They would do the most ridiculous things like, oh, no, smoke just went off in the Londinium Batcave. What's going on here? But, you know, it's not like it was deadly gas or anything. It's just, oh, what a nuisance. And let's, that's really going to make me want to come back next week. But then there were episodes like the, the uh, Catwoman Joker team up where uh, they leave – Batgirl tied up with the uh, string that constricts as her body heat goes. And, and that's a cliffhanger, though. And then, of course, they go to commercial and then they come back from the commercial. So the beats are kind of there. They're just all condensed is what he pointed. And, I, and as I'm watching those episodes, I'm like, yeah, I can see. It. I mean, it doesn't always work, but it is still there of sorts if you look. Yeah, the yeah. one where they're all there's one. I forget which episode it was where they're all, all three of them are tied up together and they have to like wiggle their ears and twitch their noses in order to get out of it or whatever. <laughs> well, that's, that's Nora Clavicle. The human that was Nora Clavicle, not. yes. Which, oh, that, yeah. that had its own problems. But, <laughs> but it, you know, the addition of Batgirl, I, I remember years ago reading an interview with her in Comic Scene magazine uh, shortly after the 89 film came out. And her, her take on it at that point was there was too many people there Mm -hmm. That once you got every character saying hello to each other, the episode was over. <laughs> and I, I kind of agree with that. I kind of don't. I, I think what Batgirl, the the change up, the soft reboot, as John put it, which is a great way to refer to it, uh, is that you really got rid of the double acts, uh, except for Batman and Robin in the third season. So like in the first two seasons, you had Chief O'Hara, Commissioner Gordon doing their shtick, which was usually, we can't do our jobs, please Batman, come save us. Uh, you, not as much, but you had like uh, Alfred and Aunt Harriet uh, right. kind of just, you know, bouncing off each other. And you had Batman and Robin. And I think what we got in the third season, which I really appreciated when I was rewatching it, was the Alfred Batgirl relationship was yeah. absolutely kind of adorable mm -hmm. like alfred is basically lying to his boss every day because he mm -hmm. knows who this he knows who this woman is he, he helps her out and uh we get to see more of i think we get to see more of uh, of alfred with the mask under the glasses which is one of my favorite things ever about the show uh I don't, but, he didn't do that in the third season that was, he didn't, that was no 
I'm I'm mixing but, the scene. Like, things like the Elf cycle and 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 him him doing all that, all that was all that was in the second season. He didn't he didn't do as much of that in the third. But, I, if I remember correctly. But I'm assuming that the thoughts are mostly positive. But what did you all think of the addition of Batgirl uh, into oh, the series? I keep going first, John. Go ahead. Um, I was overall loved it. Loved Yvonne Craig. Loved her performance. Even eventually came to appreciate how it sort of changed the dynamic of the fight scenes, which uh, as, as anybody who listens to my podcast knows, I kind of go into depth into the, the uh, artistry and uh, as how they choreograph it, but it became even more choreographed as they worked their way around because William Dozier and the producers never wanted her to punch. So she got to kick, they she pirouette, they grab her, you know, and do lifts and what have you. And she'd kick some more. I got used to that. The only downside to having Batgirl, not Yvonne Craig, but just Batgirl in general. Now, you mentioned the, the, the two act there, the two character acts there and such. I don't think Batman and Robin as, as a duo were as strong with Batgirl there because the boy wonder was no longer the boy wonder. He was just this annoying kid a lot of times <laughs> who... Who and, and 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 despite it all, God love him, Burt Ward still continued to give that role every little holy whatever and fist punch. But he became annoying and he became stupid. Um, this is the kid who, in the second season with Liberace, is recalling a piano performance where he uh, from a year before, and he recalls the the miss note that that uh, Liberace does as Chandel. And then here he is in the third season. And they're in the penguin episode with the sleeping sickness. They're looking at, at a microscope and he's like, what do you see there? Looks like a bunch of wriggling worms. And it's like, you're an idiot. You're a freaking idiot. Because then he turns it over to, to Batgirl. And she's like, oh, it's Spyro Dyra. You know, she goes, she goes off on the scientific thing. I'm like, no, no, that was his line. You kind of like took his intelligence and, and not that she didn't have her own intelligence, but like you just sucked it all away from him and he's no longer the boy wonder. And it's more like I'm wondering why he's still here. I I I hadn't thought of what, what John said, but I, I love the addition just because it it a it, it shook things up a little bit. It gave I mean, it, it, I, the, the dynamic with Alfred in particular I liked because it added some some interesting little nuances to it. Yeah. Um, as much nuance as the show ever did, anyway, um, and and it was just it, it it was something different, and the, and the fight scenes were cool. On the one hand, yes, um, her her not punching was just ridiculous. On the other hand, yeah. she could yeah. kick over her head. If I could kick like that, I wouldn't punch either. Um, <laughs> and, and I say that as a martial artist, I just you know it's like hell with it. You know, kicks like that are very they're very effective, and it and it 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 added an interesting. Um, it, it, it made the fight scenes more, and the fight scenes were, like John said, they were wonderfully choreographed and tremendous fun. Um, and and in the third season, there, I mean, that was the best. The episode that I that I did that I covered for the collection, uh, the fight scenes were fantastic. Um, well, the, the fight scene there were there were like a bunch of others where Batman and Robin pretty much got stopped instantly by the guys named after Greek gods because they needed to move the plot along. But um, but the actual climactic fight scene was fantastic. Yeah, actually, my love of watching hand to hand on screen comes from Batman sixty six. When I yeah. was a little kid, it was my, one of my favorite parts of the show was when they would just get to the fighting uh, <laughs> because you're a little kid and that's what you want to see. I mean, yeah. it's just this this uh, as has been said many many times. This series worked on two very distinct levels, yeah. and because of that, it's something I think that can be enjoyed later. I. Like I said earlier, I, I waited to see if Batgirl was going to be on the show. Yeah. Because for whatever reason, as much as I loved Batman and Robin, there was something really cool. And I think it had something to do with the fact that I was the youngest of four and the only boy in the house. Mm -hmm. So I'm surrounded by women anyways. So it, it, it was more reflective of my lived experience <laughs> that there was now a woman on the show. Uh, and looking at her now... It's it's kind of fascinating how I don't want the show was interesting in how I don't want to say progressive it was because <laughs> they were they were kind of insulting on, on you know there was many of the you know you, you know you need to stay out of this but at the same time she just still she persisted <laughs> I guess you could say <laughs> and I 
I, she had a, well, actually, I, I was about to say she had a cool vehicle. Uh, I introduced my wife to Batman 66. And when we got to season three, uh, she had many, many things to say about the, uh, the, the lacy uh, motorcycle. Uh, <laughs> most of them can't be repeated here. And there was a lot of blame in her voice, too. Like, I subjected her to this. But, you know, she had a cool hideout. She had a cool theme song. And she had a cool ride. So... She also had a really good disguise. It was subtle, mm -hmm. but the fact that she had the 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 red curls coming down from that when mm -hmm. she had in fact had short brown hair uh, was brilliant. That I when, even when I was a kid, I thought, "Wow, that's an incredibly clever disguise." Much more so, you know, like I, you 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 wonder sometimes how, especially in live action versions of of superheroes, how anybody could not notice who had seen both of them that that like Barry Allen is the Flash or the Bruce Wayne is Batman or the Superman is Clark Kent because they have the same, you know, uh, the same everything, really, aside from a pair of glasses or whatever, um, you know. Uh, but that that little detail on Batgirl's costume made all the difference because anybody trying to figure out who Batgirl is is going to be looking for a, a redhead with curls, um, of which Barbara Gordon is totally not. Um, and it, it was a nice touch. It also, I also, um, and, and this is this is very much a personal thing that, that John will appreciate. I loved the fact that in her civilian identity, Barbara Gordon was a librarian. Yes. My parents were librarians. I was raised by librarians. I worked, my first job out of college was working for Library Journal. Um, I've, I've worked in libraries both in college and, and, in, and in adulthood occasionally. Um, and librarians don't get to be the heroes very often. Um, and when and I, I love that about her and I love and I, she even got to use that not as often as I would have liked but the fact that she was a librarian was something that did occasionally work into the plot. They took away part of Wayne Manor for the library for God's sakes, yeah. you know. So I mean, obviously, yeah, it gets. Oh well, yeah, they had to save money some. <laughs> Well, we got four dollars and thirty three cents to spend on each episode here. <laughs> uh, we got an I'm interesting... sorry, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, how did Barbara? How, any, afford... how does anybody on television afford their apartments? Well, <laughs> to be fair, uh, one, uh, you know, her her father was had a very high position in the city, so I'm sure he probably knew people that could, you know, get her a good deal. But two, um, housing was expensive back then but it's not like prohibitively public corruption yes uh, <laughs> no Thanks, because because I, I don't know if he doth protest too much but in the episode i covered uh chief o'hara said uh something of like i bet it's and he's like bet are you betting chief o'hara <laughs> so yeah. either he is commissioner gordon on the tv series is dead set against any kind of corruption or he's incredibly corrupt and he's trying to deflect that onto everybody else around him. Um, but I, I, I just think I, I, there was a point where you could afford a pretty decent place. Now, how did she afford all of the gizmos to like turn everything around? That's a she different is not thing. getting her security deposit back. I yeah. Can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> she, she moves out of there. The new yeah. tenant like just moves what the whole thing. <laughs> Well, they had there was I forget the episode where the uh, the maintenance guy comes in and yeah she like running his job or something it was really because yeah, the weird. neighbors were complaining about the noise from the <laughs> rotating wall <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot more thought than I th than you would think the writers of the show would put into yeah. that sort of thing yeah um, so what did you all think of the new villains that got introduced uh, this this time out well I I mean. I did Siren and of course loved her. She 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 got cut off to a rocky start when they stuck her in the middle of uh, in a ham-fisted way in the middle of a Riddler story. But once she was on her own, it, it really was one of the better stories. In fact, there are many fans who will even say it's one of the best of the third season overall because it also harkens back to the Batman family stories, they say. I, I'm not familiar with those, but like with Robin Batgirl team ups because mm -hmm. you know Bruce is out of it under the siren spell for a good part of the episode. Um, I'm trying to think what else, who else? Well, Minerva, uh, which is the one I covered. Um, Minerva, and and both in both cases, um, 
in both in the case of both Siren and Minerva, they were they were your classic Batman sixty six villains in which you have a famous actor who wants to be on the show and they created a villain for them, um, mm-hmm. and it, it, this this was a hit and miss proposition to say the least. I mean, for every for every Vincent Price and Joan Collins, you have you know Art Carney and Van Johnson, but um, hey 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 hey. I, you're, you're never going to convince me that Van Johnson was anything other than terrible, John. We've had this argument. You, you, I, and I'll always say, anybody right. who says that is just linking it to the Archer. That's all. They they remember the Archer. Oh, I like, remember. I, go I, again. I, no, he was still terrible. He wasn't as terrible as Art Carney. I didn't. I mean, honestly, I. The, it is the it's still to this day the only performance of Art Carney I have not liked was on Batman Sixty Six, <laughs> but um, uh, and it was even it was even more terrible. But no, um. Were there any other original? Oh well, all good. Louis, right. uh, Louis the Lilac. And Louis, yeah, Louis. Oh God, Louis the Lilac. Oh See, man. I, I'll tell you something. I came to appreciate in talking, especially with uh, with author uh, Jay Smith, when he came on and we talked about Louis the Lilac, because for someone like Milton Berle, who likes to really ham it up and be he and you might even say he underplayed it even a bit too much, but just he's yeah. so subtle. He's he's you know. I don't know. I I, I first, think like I'll, Louis. I'll give you that in his first appearance. In his second appearance, Milton Berle looked like he was checking his watch, waiting until he could quit and go to the bar. Um, <laughs> he, he, that was that that wasn't just underplayed. That was somnambulant. That was just that he was he he did not seem to be giving any kind of dams about what he was doing in that one. First one, yes. Uh, the first one, he was he was actually trying. The second one, and you know, this was a stage in his career where he had like been. He, they did like a 30 year contract for him that they wound up ending because nobody wanted to watch him anymore. He was, he was really, he was, he was on a bit of a downslide on his career, unfortunately, right. but um, uh, it was, or at least his career as a TV star. I mean, he eventually, you know, into the seventies became more of a, you know, nostalgia act thing, but um, uh, it was, it, I just, and also the, the episode those those were two particularly bad episodes also. oh yeah no no but i i, they were, I still to him, him i got it because i am not a milton bro fan at all i don't really find either. Either. funny or anything but i liked him as louis the lilac now who i didn't like was and i thought it was just such a, a again because not only did they like make egghead all messed up i didn't like olga See, I liked her i just didn't like what they did to egghead with her if it had yeah. just been her it would have been fine uh, but they turned Egghead into an idiot. He was supposed to be the smartest man in Gotham. Yeah, and it, it, they just completely turned him into a into a gibbering idiot. Yeah, but that wasn't really. I don't. I, I don't blame her for that. But. I, I'm sure it's out there on YouTube. But there was also like Batman and Robin did the upfronts for the season that was heading into their third, and Milton Berle showed up. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's 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 an interesting thing. It's it's an interesting television artifact. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly because Milton Berle utters the line "Holy residuals," um, <laughs> which uh, which, which I find kind of clever, uh, in, in all honesty. But yeah, I Louis the Lilac. I think he, the the strength of him is just mainly in his name. Uh, I mean, that's that's just a really I don't know. I always found that to be a really cool villain name for this show. Like, I don't know if I'd want to you know see Louis the Lilac get his own. 12 issue miniseries where we explore his dark past uh, and all the things that made him, you know, turn to evil. Uh, but no, I, I, I liked Minerva too. The, um, you, you said Eartha Kitt uh, isn't a new villain, but she's a new. Uh, yeah. Cause it's a completely different dynamic. Yeah. Uh, J- John, when I was on your show, we talked about Julie Newmar's last episode. Yes. Where that cameraman and the way they blocked her had her yes. posterior towards the camera as much as humanly possible. Yes. Which, which if you're Julie Newmar, that that's not, you know, that's pretty much where she wants to be. I mean, mm-hmm. she's the one who designed her own costume to look as sexy as possible. But Eartha Kitt's Catwoman was a completely different take on it. And you said something earlier, Keith, you, you thought she was in more episodes than she, than she was. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the syndication demon. Because yeah. you watch all of these episodes over and over again as a kid and then, you know, getting into an adult, you know, especially, you know, they, they aired almost daily when I was a little kid. But then when I was 13 and Batman 89 came out, the show had a resurgence, uh, which I always found kind of ironic because everything about the movie was this isn't the TV show. Not everything. And, 
the whole, thing with the, Joker, the whole thing with the Joker messing up paintings and stuff that was right out of Batman sixty six. Well, <laughs> I, I I make the argument all the time that oh hi Jim, hey Jim, that Batman eighty nine today looks like the sixty show looked in nineteen eighty nine. <laughs> um, it it really had like like I was watching it and I'm like, how did we not see this? Mm-hmm. And it's I'll, just I'll take it one step further. The those all four movies have the same progression of quality and and storytelling and such as the first to third. If you look at eighty nine, that's first season Batman straight up dark. You know what have you? Uh, what is it? Batman Returns is is early second season. Batman, uh, what's what's Forever. the third? Forever. Forever. Batman Forever. That's how long the that end of the second. Life. Now we're we're doing the team ups and all this stuff, and then you get to Batman and Robin, and that is bonkers off the wall third season craziness. I, yeah. I have actually made the point more than once that if you watch all of Batman sixty six season three and then watch Batman and Robin. <laughs> That movie makes a lot more sense. <laughs> For very generous values of the word sense, we should let Jim introduce himself. <laughs> yes, Jim, please. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell everybody what you're here. Oh, you my, name's, and... my name's right here, isn't it? It's right. Here. <laughs> okay. I. Sorry, I'm just. I just woke up. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so please just go on with the conversation. I'm, well, I'm listening. <laughs> Jim's the gentleman who wrote the book that, that we were talking about at the beginning. <laughs> well, he yeah. didn't write them. He edited them. I'm sorry. And yes. created them. Yes. yes. And, and gathered us all together and made us write things. Yes. <laughs> then, made mention, us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We absolutely had to have guns put to our heads. I do want to mention um, the one, one of the new villains that, that doesn't get talked about very often for very good reason, I might add, uh, which is Ida Lupino and Howard Duff playing uh, Cassandra and Kabbalah. Well, I thought you were going to go with Nora Clavicle. No, everybody talks about how terrible Nora Clavicle is. Nora Clavicle is like held up as one of the worst things in Batman 66 all the time. Nobody ever mentions Cassandra and Kabbalah. And for, again, for good reason. They're incredibly bad, uh, but not like a fun kind of bad. They're just kind of, it's it's two people in their 50s trying desperately to sound young and hip. Um, Ida Lupino did a better job with it than Howard Duff did. Howard Duff really sounded like your old uncle who's trying to like get in with the kids, you know. Um, but that was just, that was sad. That was the, that, that episode, the enchanting Dr. Cassandra was one of the really low points of, of, of the, of, of the third season, I thought. And, and one of the least successful of the new, of the new villains they created. Well, that's where that low budget then really kicks in because we can't even afford to stage a fight. Let's just turn off the lights. Right. Yeah. (laughs) That was, that was, that was particularly hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and and you also had all the the body doubles as as the various villains. Yes, where suddenly uh, Catwoman is no longer Eartha Kitt. Yeah, right. <laughs> that wasn't confusing at all. Yeah. So now that we got Jim, uh, Jim, why? Um, I mean, outside of the you just love the series, what led you I to want to? <laughs> yeah, I I've been fooling everybody all this time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But what led you to want to do, you know, the three volumes of essays? And and one of the things that I, I loved when you were handing out the... That's not a big question. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things uh, that I loved when you were handing out the assignments was that you didn't want us to just do synopsis of it. You wanted us to do, you know, just talk about the episode in a different way. Was that just to separate the volumes from like other books on the series? Because a lot of the other, but like the the Batman Bat book is just a straight up you know guide to it, and Batmania is kind of the Sam's Choice version of that. Uh, so w- what was it that made you really want to just focus on that? that? Just that exactly. I didn't. I did. It was just a follow up to uh, Gotham City, fourteen miles, where. You know, it was not supposed to be, uh, you know, um, a big fan fest uh, for the show. It was supposed to be a, you know, varied um, opinions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not to just sit there and have the same old thing said over and over again, where it was just a, you know, a big love in, I guess, basically. 
So we we've asked a couple questions uh, before you got here. Do you have any favorite new villains from the third season that stand out to you? Oh, third season? No, yeah. not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any? Yeah, um, boy. yeah, uh, no, not 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 definitely not in third season. No, I, I would. Yeah, I would. I would say no. <laughs> That's a big no. Can Can I throw out a question here? Where do you all stand on so, like some of these episodes that are either like fan loved or fan loathed, like say uh, uh, the surfing episode? <laughs> the surfing episode is one of those uh, really, really terrible episodes that you love despite yourself, at least for me. Um, I mean, it's, it's objectively horrible, um, but it's so ridiculous and seeing Gordon and O'Hara dressed up as beach bums and and the incredibly terrible blue screening uh, of, of Batman and the Joker in front of the waves. The fact that Cesar Romero still after three seasons puts 100% of himself into the Joker no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unlike some of the other actors who were very obviously phoning it in by season three, Cesar Romero was still right there in it the whole time. And, and just the sheer ridiculousness of it. Um... So I think that that one that one's one of those so bad it's good ones, you know. I, I'm I'm kind of with Keith on that. That you know, if you're gonna do something ostentatious, be ambitious with it. You know, when when you are presented with the idea of Batman surfing, just in general, that's just something you would never associate with the character. Mm -hmm. uh, Especially not know, Adam West version. Yeah, you know, he 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 does not strike me as somebody who likes to go to the beach, must much less learn to surf. But somebody said, okay, we're gonna have them surf because you know the kids, the kids these days, they like the surfing and the Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys, and, and we're gonna do that. Jan and Dean did that album, so obviously the kids like the surfing. So the fact that they went for it is one of those things where I'm like, you magnificent SOBs. Seriously. <laughs> like I I, I I can't hate it. I can't dislike it. It's one of those things where it's not like the bat credit card from Batman and Robin, where you look at that and you're just like, that's terrible. This is two people going all in Batman wearing the swim trunks over his uh, uniform, over his uniform uh, because of course, I mean, it's obviously memorable. They keep making merchandise about it. Yes. Like if there is a Funko Pop, if there is an action figure line, they're going to have Surfing Batman and Surfing Joker in it. Yeah. I actually Jim? saw somebody cosplaying as Surfing Batman oh. at New York Comic Con one year. Really? Yeah, with the board yeah. and everything. He was you know, doing the whole thing with the trunks and, and the surfboard. Mm. It was great. Wow. A lot of people were taking pictures with him, too. <laughs> Again, it's it's like one of those things. Like like if, if it's so hated, why is it? I think it's because it just sticks well, it in your head. <laughs> well, I mean, I, yeah. Okay, I, mean, I can't like, I can't argue with that. One, that one and and the Riddler, the one Riddler episode from the third season, both are ones where you're like wondering what exact. They never really adequately explain what the villain's end game is here. But see, the thing with the Riddler episode, though, the only saving grace is just that it's Frank Gorshin back again. Oh, yeah. Other than that, it has nothing to hang its hat on. You no. can find moments in the in the the, the, the surfing episode with the you know surfs up. Okay. You can you can find moments. You can and, and it goes beyond Caesar Romero. You know, in that yeah. regard, there is something redeeming in that that you can hang a hat on. But, but, me, they, the, the, the Riddler one is just, it's pathetic. But the thing they both have in common is that it's not really clear what the villain is after in either case. There, there's, there's, it's like, I'm going to become a champion boxer, okay? I'm going to be the champion surfer. What does that get them? Well, I you thought know, the whole I thing mean, with the surfing was then he got the kids hooked. I, I guess, but yeah. I mean, it just didn't... It, For it, what? Yeah. <laughs> um... <sighs> You know, because yeah. we're already hooked on surfing. It just, it, it, it didn't, <laughs> that, that just didn't make any sense. Um, and, and also, um, one, one thing I was amused when I did my rewatch for this, um, the guy who played uh, Riptide was Skip Ward, who was apparently William Dozier's first choice for the Green Hornet. And oh my God, did he make the right choice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was, he, if he had been the Green Hornet, uh, that would have been disastrous. Hmm. Wow. What, what about you, Jim? I, 
I'm totally lost. Start all over again. <laughs> I'm still, I'm where still you, waking where up. Where do you so. stand? Like, like, cause right. I, I brought up like the, 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 the controversial yet iconic episodes of the third season. Okay. You either love it or hate it. And I, I okay. threw out We're the just one talking there, so about stuff. third season. Is that right? Right. Correct. right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Can we talk about another season? <laughs> <laughs> um, No, I think I'm right in line with what everybody else thinks about, <laughs> about the third season. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I mean, know, it, I, no, I, there, there are no wrong answers. I mean, if, yeah, if, if, yeah, if I, I, go um, with Jim, sometimes there are. No, <laughs> Matt, go, come back to me. Sorry. Well, I, 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 I actually, let, I would like to ask Jim a question that isn't about that, but about the, the, the book. Well, Which, before, yeah. before before you do, let me just throw in, oh. so we tie this end up with, with yeah. uh, Surf's Up. There's a perfect example, whether or not the, the, the story makes sense throughout the whole thing. There's a perfect example from opening shots of Dick and Bruce, we're duly deputized agents, they get the phone call, off we go to a cliffhanger right in the middle as they're turned right. into surfboards, you know, and they have to get out of it, come back for after commercial. To the bat fight at the end, we get all the beats of a first or second season two parter in that one little episode. And you also That's get Johnny awesome. Green and the Green Man. <laughs> yes, yes. With green hair, Who's, no less. Who is a really cool guy? I got to meet him once. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Hmm. But Jim, you had a feature at the back of of Oof Bop Splat that I just was completely enchanted by which was the fourth season of batman 66 ah uh, yes yes the fourth can, season can you can you talk about that a little bit oh, oh um that's that was meant to be a book all of its own hmm. and uh because of my unfortunate run-ins with uh dc and and warner brothers over image uh use which for some strange reason they're they're rather prickly about um, that uh, it, it came down to it that I didn't do it as an entire book, but I had a bunch of notes laying around, which was basically going to be a Bible uh, for the fourth book. I just turned those into an essay, uh, basically, and, and did a complete what if there was a fourth season. Which, so that's what that turned out to be. Which was it's tremendous fun. It was one of it was one of my favorite pits in the. Thank in the you. Place. Unfortunately, no one has uh, no one has ever really mentioned it. In, in really, no, I think maybe and there's one review where somebody literally just mentions what it is offhand, yeah. but nobody has said anything at all about it. You're one of the very first people who's even brought it up, and 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 if it is, it's somebody that's been in the book, but like no <laughs> reader has ever brought. So you know. To this moment, I, I, my thought is that nobody liked it. You know well, that they thought it was silly and and kind okay. of stupid. <laughs> so everybody watching this, go buy the book. Yes. Uh, Gary put the Amazon link up earlier, and we'll, we'll put it up again probably. Buy the book, read the book, read Jim's essay. You should probably yeah. read Michael's and John's and my essays too. But read Jim's thing at the back of the book with season four, and write a review on Amazon and say how great it is. Yeah, that's your or, or just say something about it. Again, you know, <laughs> I I was kind of thinking by this point that I probably shouldn't have done it because I thought maybe it it went over like a Led Zeppelin, you know. Eh. Well, I mean that it, it seems like a natural. I mean that's what that's what yeah. fans do when they're discussing shows that end. I don't want to say prematurely because you know it it seemed like they had run out of gas by the end of the third season. Right. Uh, uh, anyways, I mean, there, there's the story uh, that's been out there forever that, you know, NBC called and said, yeah, we're going to pick it up. And they had already destroyed the sets. Yeah. So that's that's a no go. But well, that's that's where it all be. That's where, you know, my premise begins and that they decided to go ahead and do it. NBC and uh, and then just kind of went from there, but tried to be as like grounded or realistic with it. And that's what everybody was going to be told if we had done it as a book was that don't do anything ridiculous. Don't do anything that never would have happened. Um, I, I, I think there's somebody else I brought up the uh, like, don't put metamorpho 
in there because that would, <laughs> you know, in 1968 or 69, that would never have ever have happened. You know, so well, you did about, have poison ivy in there who did work as yes, uh, right. And, and, and you know, don't put any actor in there that uh, was you know deceased at the time, or, <laughs> or you know, just things yeah. things like that. It had to it, it had to be a what if this really happened? Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, in my version of it, it turns out to be like the worst season. Or, uh, well, or at least it devolves into the worst season ever. Uh, the very last episode that I, I put out there is considered to be just the, like the, you know, just the absolute worst. It made Nora Clavicle look good. <laughs> Which I'm doing, I might add. Thank you. Because Nora Clavicle was pretty bad. That was it. Y yes. Uh, uh, yes, although John and I, we used to say that um, that uh, there was always something in each episode of Batman that you could pull out at least one little thing and say that that you know this is fun or this is good or I like that little bit. You know there was there was never a one hundred percent completely bad episode uh, of Batman. That's true. I actually I can even tell you what it is at least for me in the Nora Clavicle episode, which is when they're doing the Pied Piper bit with the mice. Really? Oh, okay. That's the good well, part. I love that. The three, because the three, because because Adam West, Burt Ward, and Yvonne Craig completely threw themselves, even though they weren't actually playing anything, because it was sure. all in, But they really threw themselves into the hole. We're 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 being the Pied Piper for these mice, and just you know, absolutely sold the bit. You know, sure, sure. Um, and and also, I like the roll. I like the rolling pins that the the, the female cops had. That was cute. <laughs> okay. I mean, with the with the uh, high school musical sets in the background of the waterfronts. Oh my god! Yeah. That, that, that that's when you knew they were really low. I mean, it's so bad that one of the other things uh, of the offshoot. Now that we're done with uh, reviewing the main episodes, is myself and and Robert Long are discussing movies that either were inspired by or actually are direct. Like we looked at two Filipino movies that were Batman and Robin from the sixties uh, and eighties right. and such. And at the end of every one of these discussions of these movies, we've done about nine of them so far. We always put out the question, would you rather watch this movie or Nora Clavicle? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the, the gauge. It's like, yep, this yep, movie yep. is so bad. Or is it, or is it better than Nora Clavicle? The, the thing that got me about Nora Clavicle was I was on her side during most of the episode. I mean, I'm sorry. The, the, the Mayor Linseed was talking about how he had to give in to his wife because he's worn the same shirt for weeks and he hasn't had a decent meal in months. And you know what? Her platform is that women can run Gotham better than men. And if the mayor doesn't know how to operate a washing machine or get his staff to provide him with clean clothes, she's got a point. Yeah, I, I was about I was about to say when you have Chief O'Hara and, and Commissioner Gordon in the second season when they are informed that Batman is out of town, look at each other in in a panic. Then obviously somebody else could probably do that better. You know what? It's kind of funny because you know the the sci-fi classics track. We we try to you know as as a group we try to be you know like focus on the fun aspects and not try to yuck anybody's yum. But I think what Batman 66 season three proves is that you can only take that so far. <laughs> there, there, there comes a point where even like the most devoted people to this series. Uh, and I love that now with, with everything out, you know, like legit on, on Blu-ray and DVD and you can buy it, you know, uh, on Apple or through Amazon and we have all of this merchandise, which never happened before. And the fact that on most of the merchandise, when they do the Joker, they have the mustache on it, which I <laughs> always love. To see. Like, it's it's my favorite detail because it's just like there's somebody who's really paying attention. And um, it's also, it's purely a product of high def because you couldn't yeah. really see the no. mustache regularly, yeah. you know, in, in on regular definition TVs. I certainly never noticed it when I was a kid, but you can't miss it now. <laughs> no, it's it's when you got a fifty like a fifty-five inch screen, and it's even just DVD. You're like, wow, that's uh, 
that's pretty apparent there, Caesar. That's a <laughs> that's a bold choice, but you know, I guess when you fell into the acid in the in the red hood outfit, that you were you had a mustache at the time, and instead of turning green, it turned white. So that's how we're going to explain this. But it just seems like even the most ardent defender of this series, you go season three. Suddenly, everybody wants to like pull out a bottle of whiskey and just start talking, going through group therapy together about it. <laughs> Which is kind of what this is, really. Yeah. <laughs> nice of you all to watch our little therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> We're working through a lot here. Yeah. Don't don't forget that uh, I think one of the things I like about Nora Clavicle is that Barbara Rush is still with us. Yes. And she's yeah. she is one of the very few main villains that is still alive. And she is definitely the one that everybody forgets is mm -hmm. still with us. Yeah. She she was I got to meet her when I was out in California a few years ago. It was very brief. It was at that opening of the the museum, uh, the Hollywood Museum, when they did that whole big Batman display. And she was there along with Lee Merriweather and a couple of others. Burt Ward was there and such. And it was very brief. It was because she was surrounded by people. And I got to hold her hand for a second and she looks and all I got to say was hello. You know, it was the mm -hmm. weirdest thing. But like she looked at me and for that moment, she was like and she just said hello back to me. And it was the sweetest thing. And the next thing you know, it's like she's gone because her handlers were all like, no, no, you need to get out of here. There's just too many people here, mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> swarming mm -hmm. over her. You know? mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Lee Merriweather, it's the easy. She's like sitting in a corner there just quietly. And I just sat next to her. I'm like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, which is which is a shame because she was excellent as Catwoman in the movie. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, I again, it seems like the three Catwomen we got, we got three very different Catwomen, which mm -hmm. is very appropriate for the character in the comics, at least. It seems like yeah. every time they they bring her out again, it's a new version of it mm -hmm. uh, or a new take on the character. Uh, but no, that that's kind of a, that's a little sad to hear that Lee Merriweather was over in the corner because it's not like Batman was the only thing she ever did. Yeah, from <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, she's my favorite Catwoman, even even more than Julie Newmar. Hmm. And, I, and I well, one of the reasons I like her is that she's not Julie Newmar, and she one of the reasons that she's not very well thought of is because she's not Julie Newmar. Which is her. really, really sad because yeah. she, she actually poured a lot into uh, yes. all the stuff that she did, the little things that she did in, in mm -hmm. the feature film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she's a, you know, a stunningly beautiful woman. And, and again, because she's not Julie Newmar, she gets short shrift constantly. And because she's not Eartha Kitt, that, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll go that uh, as far as that goes too it's it's a real real shame um in my um what if fourth season she gets to be catwoman in the fourth season that they don't have julie anymore they don't have eartha so they go to lee so she gets to play it finally in the series mm -hmm. she yeah. um she also she was also really good as lisa in the king tut two-parter in season yes. two that she was in um really? king tut's two batman's waterloo which has a uh, my one of my absolute favorite moments in all of Batman sixty six, which was milk and cookies as a euphemism for sex. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. Bruce. Bruce finally gets lucky. Yep. yep. Uh, Catwoman. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, John. I was going to say Catwoman was because we've had three Catwomen, we had uh, three Mister Freezes, we had two Riddlers. You know. Yeah. Um, no, As there was only one Riddler. I have no idea what you're talking about. There was oh, only Scott, one. I, 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 I would say it. we had one and a half Riddlers. Stop <laughs> it. Stop it, you all. Uh, no, I love John Aston. Don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, more so than the Adams Family, I'm a Night Court fan from way back. <laughs> and he was one of the best side characters on that show. So it's not like I dislike John Aston. He was just not appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, will always, I will always put it if Frank Gorshin hadn't been there first, he would have been just fine in the I role. agree. I agree yeah. with that completely. Or if he had been a different character. There was no, you know. No, I mean, or or you know, I mean they already did that once with the puzzler, because the puzzler True. was pretty much a rewrite of the Riddler anyway, but it, mm -hmm. it worked in that case. Um and, and I think they should have done the same thing with Aston, but um mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, or if yes, if he had been if he had been the Riddler from Jump, it would have been fine. 
It's the same. Um, it's the Lee it's... Merriweather effect again. John Aston yeah. takes a he gets a lot of crap just for not being Frank Gorshin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. actually not a. It's actually not a bad episode, really. No. No. Uh, and uh, I I love the music in the beginning. That's a, it's that uh, new music for that episode. The uh, combination of uh, happy birthday, happy anniversary with the Batman theme and kind of yeah. woven together. It's a really, really cool piece of music. My, my, my point in just bringing that all up is that, you know, as a kid, I had my favorite Riddler. I had my favorite Mr. Freeze. But with Catwoman... It was just across the board. I never blinked and went, oh, Catwoman's different. Even when we finally got to Eartha Kitt, it was like she's still Catwoman, even though the portrayals were different in each instance. Yeah, I I, I was the same. I mean, you know, I, I, I joke about John Aston, but when I was a kid and it was a different Riddler, it's not like I was just like, no, I'm, I'm out. I, you know, I'm going to go. I'm going to change the channel and watch something else. It was mm -hmm. it was still Batman. And oh, yeah. like I, I never as a kid, I never noticed that there was three different, three different Mr. Freezes, which kind of points mm. to the fact that I was not a very observant child. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it didn't matter because it was just, you know, it was the same type of villain. Right. Where, you know, it, it's not like, it's not like they completely and utterly changed everything about the character. And it was, you know, we, we noticed the differences between the Catwoman performances now, but like John said, when I was a kid, it was just like, it was Eartha Kitt and it didn't matter because mm. she was, it was Batman fighting Catwoman. This is what I came to see. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's interesting that and it's a testament to Eartha Kitt that she doesn't get the same crap that um that Lee Merriweather and, and John Aston get. Um, I, I, I think that probably has more to do with the fact that Eartha Kitt is like an icon. Well I mean, yeah. you 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 know, it's just you know her her music is brought out every Christmas with Santa mm -hmm. Baby. Right. And, you know, like if you watch sitcoms in the 80s and 90s, if Eartha Kitt shows up, it's like I, I remember specifically an episode of Living Single uh, where she guest starred and all the male characters were just like all about it. Hey, it's hey, Joe. Joe. Joe's here to close this out. Oh, y'all <laughs> keep going. <laughs> okay. Oh. And you just ground the pedal. Oh, actually, y'all keep going. <laughs> Well, we got a. We just got a couple more minutes left. Is there anybody who has any last thoughts on the series or the third season at all? I, I do want to thank Jim for doing this series of essay collections because yes. it was so much fun to do mm -hmm. the three pieces that I did. I I got, I, I I the first one I got to do research on prison reform, which is not something I ever expected to research when writing about Batman sixty six, but it was actually very relevant to that episode because that was the one that introduced warden Crichton. um for 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 the second season i got to do the in, in his honor of the penguin design of the penguin there was a debate between batman and the penguin when they were running for mayor they got cut off because there was a thing happening so i did a transcription of their makeup debate so I, it was the actual debate between batman and the penguin which was so much fun to write um and then for the last one i actually did it as two people watching Batman 66, one who had seen it several times, showing it to their friend who was seeing it for the first time, and their back and forth commentary on the episode. Rich Hanley, who helped Jim uh, edit these books, told me that he now wants me to do like an entire series of essays about each Batman 66 episode with those two people, <laughs> um, which I'm not doing. But, <laughs> but that was it, was, it was a great project to work on, and I'm really grateful. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 come on. I'm, I'm kind of with uh, I'm kind of with Keith. I, I I started doing my essay, and suddenly I'm doing research on what do, what people thought of divorce in the '60s, and <laughs> the different the different forms of gambling. And I'm just like, why am I going? And my wife's like, what What are you looking at? Because she came in and saw like gambling statistics on the computer. I'm like, doing research for my essay. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. And. Um... <laughs> I got to be in the first two books and I think I might've gotten the best episode in book two when I did the green Hornet crossover. Uh -huh. And um, I, I feel like, I feel like um, that, that there was nothing else I could do with it at that point. I thought, well, I, 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 I think you, I think that's because you whined a lot and, and, <laughs> and begged me to do it. I really did. I really did. But, 
<laughs> but Jim, have you have you pimped the book enough? No, there, it's never enough. It's never <laughs> not, enough. Not here, no. <laughs> a lot. Um, Jim also was late to the panel, but we we've been I'm we've been pimping it a lot. So. It's true. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that yeah, and and I'm glad to be able to have kept all of you off the streets at least for a little while while <laughs> you were you. Yeah. writing your essays. Did you also, Jim, hmm. talk about? As a sidebar, the other book you have. No, no, Joe. I've been, I've hardly been here. <laughs> no. I, okay. Well, then you talk I, about it. Took me a while to even realize what the hell we were talking about. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> what what book? <laughs> oh, the Dark Shadows book. Oh, well, it was. This is about Batman, not about not about Barnabas. <laughs> but they were running around the same time. Plug it. Yeah. It's the American sci-fi classics thing. There are no rules here. Oh, okay. Well, there, I have a book about Dark Shadows out called Running Home to Shadows. Uh, basically a book of memories of uh, uh, writers who were kids back during the original classic run of uh, Dark Shadows, all telling their stories about, uh, quote unquote, running home from school to watch Dark Shadows. But um bum yeah, you you guys, uh, there's so much stuff out there, and um, I am I am tickled that all you guys are here. I apologize for, uh, I guess, whining to Jim to get in the book, but you know it ended up working out great for me. I don't care about anybody else. Um, <laughs> but you guys, if um, you guys are, if you think you're done, everybody, let's go around the interwebs and everybody tell everybody where you can be found. Should you wish to be found, <laughs> Keith, you go uh, first. Since you're 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 up you're up, you're you're in the first oh, position. Oh, okay. Right now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm I'm Keith Ari DeCandido. You can find me. Uh, search my name on the internet. I am the only Keith DeCandido you will find. Um, my incredibly terrible website is at decandido.net, uh, which is still incredibly terrible after all these years. I'm going to get it upgraded one of these millennia. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's a link to all the places you can cyber stalk me. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram. Uh, you can find me on Tor.com. You can find really Gary. That was the whole link you put in there. Um, <laughs> you can find me on Tor.com talking about pop culture, including Batman sixty six. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Crad COVID Readings where I read my short fiction. I have a Patreon, uh, Patreon.com/slash/Crad, which has lots of cool stuff um, mm. that you should all go and support right now. Um, and I have lots of books available that are on that are available from whatever your online book dealer of choice is. Um, again, I'm Michael Bailey. I run the Fortress of Bailey Tude podcasting network um, because no one else will, uh, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> and I there's like 700 odd episodes of various shows, uh, mostly about Superman and Batman, but I talk about all kinds of comic books, uh, comic book fun stuff. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in the book we've been talking about tonight. Uh, hopefully that leads to being in other books. So <laughs> I, I, like I said, a couple, uh, no, whoever said that needs to go away now. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, but yeah, sure. just go to fortress of Bailey com and check out all the podcasts. And John. I am John S. Drew, your old bat chum. I'm the host of the Bat Cave podcast. You can find us here on Facebook. We have a page, or you can head on over to the Bat Cave uh, We're on Twitter, Bat Cave Podcast. There, um, like I said, we're we're done with the main reviews, but we are covering all this Batman adjacent stuff, uh, including the current episode that. Uh, our own Joe Crow and I did together on the Monster Squad, where we talked about the Music Man, played by uh, oh, what was shit. it, Marty Allen? Oh, yes. <laughs> the music. And man. Joe, I chortle. Chortle. The music said. man. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> that dude. <laughs> I have not laughed so hard. <laughs> it's twenty-two minutes of. I think they just turned the camera on and Marty Allen said, okay, here we go. Yes. And it is it's like some third season Batman episodes. Yeah. <laughs> but that dude, and I had to, I had to, and John knows this. Um, um, I had to Google some of the things that um, 
that made it onto this Saturday morning cartoon yes. that uh, Marty Allen was saying. And all of it is weird, obscure New York references from like the art scene from the, the early seventies. Yep. What is that? Yep. But it was excellent. It was a hip happening time. man. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and, and Jim, tell us where you can be found. I, I want to thank, is it Lynn, Lynn for, for being the only person to have bought that Dark Shadows book? And, and, yeah, and, you were the one, it. Lynn. Thank I, you. I knew, yeah. that, I, I knew that someday I wanted to meet the one person who has <laughs> bought that book so far. So thank, thank, thank you, you very Lynn. much. I appreciate that. <laughs> please leave a review, Lynn. Yeah. Yes. Would you please? So that we at least have one review of that book. Um, I like everybody else, you can find me on Amazon. Uh, I have a couple of books on moonstonebooks.com, the Kolchak novel and the Green Hornet uh, novel. Um, and I'm on Facebook uh, for uh, the the page that I have for Becky Books, which is one of my imprints. Uh, so it's called the Jim Beard and Becky Books page. Uh, you can find me at Flinch Books, which is my other uh, uh, publishing house, uh, and then um, Gotham City 14 Miles has its own Facebook page, and uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Writer Jim Beard. There it is. Um, and uh, as uh, John just said, uh, go to the Batcave podcast. Get Bob, uh, good night, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, Go to the Bat Cave podcast, and you can find me um, talking about Monster Squad with uh, with John and all of these guys. Are you've seen them on here before on the quarantine panels? You'll see them again because once you're in, as Gary can confirm, once you're onto the American Sci-Fi Classics track, that is a contract in blood. So there's no way you guys are not going to be on other panels. Yes, thank you. And um, if you are watching us on the Facebook, you're already where you need to be. If you're not watching us on YouTube, or if you are, stay there. It's fine. But Google American Sci-Fi Classics and watch us on the YouTube. And um, if you like the pro wrestling, Google Spartan Wrestling. I'm there, too. Uh, I, I have a, a weird set of interests. Okay, ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the and, understatement of 2022. And this is why he got the Green Hornet episode. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. The, the American Sci-Fi Classics track is like a black hole without a discernible event horizon. So you don't know you're there and stuck until it is far too late. Far but there is an disc. <laughs> but Keith, Michael, John, Jim, thank you guys. Thank you, Gary, for uh, being the uh, man behind the curtain. And uh, we will see you guys very, very soon. And uh, join us in a couple of weeks when I believe we are going to be talking about a, a certain movie that came out in late May at this time. Um 45 years ago? We won't force you all to watch it. That's right. Um, what movie could you possibly be talking about? Uh, is is it is it Megaforce? I'm not positive. But no, it's Annie Hall, right? It is Annie <laughs> The 45th anniversary of Annie Hall, everybody. Okay, it's now I need funny. Annie Hall as Annie Ken. <laughs> oh, my heart. <laughs> but guys, thank you very much. Thank you for everybody who hung out with us. We will see you all very, very soon. Join us semi-daily on the Facebooks. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, guys. Come see us on Wednesday. Just Has this been awkward enough? Has it been it's, awkward long enough? Everybody, yeah. Let's yeah, all awkward. Now we're still live. Are we supposed yeah. to stay still? Yeah. Yeah.